There's no easy way to say this. Guess I'll say it to you. Today I'm joined by Mr. Mr. Ken Waterhouse of uh, of No Good Sons. How are you doing, Ken? Not bad. It's raging hangover as always, but pretty good, mate. Pretty good. How are you? Yeah, not bad. Just busy with like getting the Christmas single ready with the band. Um, you know, because I, I told you Chris Barris filmed it. Um, so we went and see the first edit of that. Uh, PR's kind of going mad for our um, our covers EP, which will be out soon. So yeah, just really busy and gigs. Like I said, Christmas is just back to back, so uh, it's good. You know, try and get some Christmas gigs because you got to uh, wear your bad Christmas jumpers, mince pies, and mulled wine. So uh, yeah, Christmas is always a, a fun time, fun time of year for us. Yeah, we're uh, we're about the same. We uh, we've got uh, hopefully we're just trying to iron out the the final detail to get the vinyl sorted out for album number three. Nice. Uh, we're just sorting out all the artwork and everything for that. Um, but we're hoping that's going to be around uh, Christmas time. And mm -hmm. we've got quite a few gigs booked up. Um, and we'll be a couple of headliner slots uh, around, around Christmas and New Year's Eve as well. We've got a big one coming up New Year's Eve, which I'm looking forward to in Reading. Um, but yeah, same as, like you said, Christmas time just gets busy. Next thing you know, it's like every weekend and then even weekdays just starting to get booked up now for gigs. Yeah. And hopefully we can get on the road next year for a couple of shows. That'd be fun. Yes, yes. As I say, once, once we get all this... All the admin and all the artwork and everything sorted out. We can yeah. uh, look up for some beers and discuss. Vinyl's a bit of a pain in the backside because I mean we've had obviously the second album making tracks that we put up on vinyl and just kind of the lead time on that was just ridiculous. Um, and just obviously all the, the approval processes, you know, he hearing like the the white label masters and kind of approving them, the track gaps. You know, it's a lot more complicated than CD. You know, but yeah. I still think you know CD you get a, a better a bit rate. Um, you know, then you ever will in vinyl, so you don't get the same warmth. But just, I think CD's coming back, to be honest. I mean, what do you think, CD and vinyl? So I'm a, I'm a huge vinyl nerd. Uh, I yeah. absolutely am a vinyl. Um, and this is probably what, you know, we're super stoked about getting the album on vinyl. But thanks to lockdown, my vinyl uh, collection trebled. Uh, so lots of new furniture to store it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. It's just something about vinyl that I just, I just really dig. Uh, I think, sadly, it, one of the best feelings in the world is like when you open up the vinyl and then it's coloured vinyl and it's like, ooh, a nice little surprise. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, just, yeah, just nerd out with it. I think, you know, our, our drummer um, and our, our, our other guitarist and, and producer, Martin, like all, all three of us, like Catty as well on bass, he's just building up his collection now as well. Um, it'll take me a little while to compete with Martin, but yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but then you get into the geeky stuff of like the frequency response. Um, you know, you obviously, the, you know, you look at um, the kind of, you look at a vinyl lathe then you look at the sort of the gaps, you know, the gaps between each kind of track as such, or, you know, and you see like, it's difficult to kind of, you can't really obviously compare vinyl to CD as such, because obviously, obviously a completely different processing um, sort of aspect, but just you notice obviously a different like a warmer sound but you're not going to get like the same frequency response as you could you know kind of obviously on a cd you know you've got a wider frequency response but it's also kind of quite compressed but you, yeah you just yeah you can't you can't get the same the thing is the thing is i mean like with vinyl i'm a bit of a purist so like i used to have a, like a, a, a good setup ages ago and basically i had a, a um, an amp it was a riga amp basically had no tone controls on it it was literally volume and that was it and i thought that's quite good because you get some people want to add bass take bass take your mids out or whatever and you kind of mess about with the sound but riga i think they kind of were like right they believe they'd kind of tune the amp to like they think perfect for listening to any music um and you know it was pretty good obviously like listening to some like thrash metal and stuff you know wanting a bit more bass but actually you know you kind of appreciate like a it almost sounded like a neutral um sort of eq and it was actually quite interesting to to listen to it on that and then obviously you know your phones and spotify and stuff you can do whatever you can add dolby atmos and all that crap but um but no it's interesting but yeah no vinyl cd i don't know but vinyl takes up a lot more uh, space and it weighs a bloody ton as well i think we only take 10 on the road um to most gigs it just weighs an absolute yeah, ton yeah there is that i remember when i moved uh, house and i think the heaviest thing was my vinyl collection it was a right pain in the ass to just like shift over but yeah. uh and now, I mean, that was before lockdown. So, like, now that it's treble, I dread to think how many trips that's going to take. <laughs> yeah. I'll tell you what I'm going to do, actually, because I normally do this at the end, but I'll do it at the beginning. Uh, it's a bit unconventional. So I'm going to give you three questions, and you're going to answer as quick as possible. So whatever your first answer is, we'll take it. So what was your first concert that you ever went to? 
Bruce Springsteen, Earl's Court 2. I must have been about 12 years old. Um, okay. That was the first time I saw that many people in, in one building. And yeah. I went, you know, he had all the lights around and everything. He did the gig. And I always remember, um, you know, he put the floodlights on for Born to Run. You know, and there's Bruce Springsteen. You know, I'm, I'm 12 years old. He's mm-hmm. like, come on. And then, like, the, 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 the Earl's Court was just, like, rammed. And mm-hmm. I've never seen that amount of people. And I don't know what I was more blown away by, like, the, the amount of people. Uh, and then just the sound and the sheer volume from in mm-hmm. that hall. Yeah, first gig ever. Okay. Just, yeah. First single. First single. And was it on was it on CD or cassette or mini disc? I don't know. Uh, it would have been cassette. Oh man, what was the first single? It was an Aerosmith single. Okay, nice. I can't remember which one now. Hangman, uh, Hangman's Jury was it? Huh? Was it Hangman's Jury? It must have been. Yeah, permanent vacation, wasn't it? So, yeah, it must have been. First cassette. Got it from a car boot sale. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's just this Aerosmith cassette. And I was like, that looks cool. I'll, I'll check them out. Okay. And then first album. Uh, first album yeah. was, uh, that was Aerosmith as well. But it was okay. a big one, which is the, the yeah. compilation for a minute. But uh, that was my first. I, I don't think compilations count. If people say, what's your favourite album? So what's your favourite Beatles album? And someone goes, the best of the Beatles. It's like, that's not an album, it's a compilation. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, it's a good, good collection of songs. Yeah, I, I I dig that one. I mean, my first Aerosmith record that I bought was, uh, the, the vinyl was Permanent Vocation. Yeah, um, great album, yeah. Still my favourite, still my favourite album of theirs, man. Cool. Okay, so, right, what, what I want to kind of, you know, people who don't know you as such, and obviously don't know, no good sons, obviously the band you've been in want to kind of give people a bit of a a journey into kind of I guess where you are today. So so just yeah, can t- tell me like um yeah what what first got you wanting to pick up guitar versus I don't know like most kids go to school they get sort of forced to play the recorder you know how, why why guitar? Um, so like my absolute idol, my my rock god uh, is Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top. Uh, everyone right. that does he knows I'm a I'm a huge. ZZ Top fan, nerds. Um, I've had the privilege of, of meeting Mr. Gibbons. Um, and, and he just, I remember the first time I saw him play. And I was like, the first gig was like, you know, Bruce Springsteen. But like when I was a kid and be like watching MTV and, mm-hmm. you know, when uh, Give Me All You're Loving and, and Legs and those videos were coming on to MTV. And it's like, wow, this is insane. Um, and ZZ Top really took it for me. I, I got my first guitar actually when I was about 18, but I didn't really invest time into playing it it was just it collected dust more than anything so i wasn't like you know i can make some noise and uh, i don't know how to play and i've got to invest time in that and i was not the uh not the kind of guy that would invest time to 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 learn so it's not really until about i think 20 uh 23 i reckon maybe before then maybe about 21 22 but yeah 23 really started to to get some interest and, and, and gain a few few chords and licks. And then it was all strictly, you know, online tabs and stuff. I couldn't mm-hmm. just listen to something uh, and, and try and jam along to it because, you know, scales are some fish. What do you mean guitar scales? Yeah. Yeah. It's just nuts. And then over the years, it's just self-taught and just general progression. Uh, it obviously helps when you've got a master in your band who's an absolute guitar genius. So you're not um, talking about yourself. <laughs> Uh, no, <laughs> mate. no, 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 no. I, uh, I, I'm, 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 on, I'm honest with myself. You know, I can, you know, it, the blues. It looks easy, but it's not because it's all about timing. It's all about groove, man. And and I think that that's you know going back to that Billy Gibbons and ZZ Top. You know, they're the, the, for me. I think they're the first bands that actually took blues into the realms of rock and created this yeah. blues vibe when they did their first gig. Oh at a, uh, you know, all blues festival, um, you know, around sounds like BB King and Howlin' Wolf. I remember that they did, uh, they did this gig and it was sort of like the after party, you know, when there's just these three kids rocking up to play some blues that, you know, some of the biggest names in blues history were there. And uh, yeah, Billy Gibbon said like, he saw Howlin' Wolf stood on the side of the stage mm-hmm. having the time of his life. He just got to think, yeah, that's, that's the birth of, of blues rock. And then that's really what caught me. You know, going into okay. the guitars and stuff, and it's just like 
and I think back of all the stuff that we've played, all the stuff that I've written and everything, it's blues rock core uh, all the way through. You know, you can have your groove, you can have this, that and the other, but that, that blues roots really, really resonates with me. Um, so everything I write over the years is progressed um, has been blues and it, it shows I think it, it definitely shows in the new album that's coming out um, you know, with the No Good Sons it was that sort of blues uh, rock uh, there's definitely you know a, a strong taste of country in there as mm. well with some of the ballads and stuff but it all resonates down to to the blues rock and that I just want to carry on that flag and never going to be in the realms of uh, Billy Gibbons good but if I can hold my own then I'll be happy yeah. with that I think blues is kind of I don't know it's like blues or, or rock you know at the centre of most you know modern music you know that kind of style and the kind of like pentatonic scales and think you know it's all kind of yeah rock and blues is always in kind of I guess whatever whatever you write and then obviously you know your, your genres and your sub genres and your sub sub genres you know they're all kind of just like an a, an offshoot or like a, an evolution or like a slight um alteration of you know blues or, or, or rock or well you're like classical I think even classical really when you look at the scales and things you know that's yeah. kind of in in all music I think kind of like almost classical is like um like when I say sort of like Neanderthal music, it's like before the dawn of time, I think you had like classical music and then everything's kind of really spurred off, you know, from that and in, into its own kind of musical um, like manifestation. I remember like as a guy called Ed at school and he took me to the proms uh, one year at the Albert Hall and I'd sort of appreciate classical music but never really kind of... I don't know, understood it because, like I said, I'm a self-taught musician. So, like, I understand sheet music and a bit like crescendos and, and whatever, you know, the basic stuff. But I went to see it and I think it was, um, it was, uh, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, something by Dvorak and, um, and Debussy. Uh, Debussy, was it Midnight Sonata? I can't, anyway. And I remember watching it and I, and I was literally blown away by the sheer kind of epic sound and scale of everything because obviously you know you you can literally hear every nuance of every you know the violin the the bassoon the double bass or whatever you can literally pick out every element but it just comes into this kind of epic Hans Zimmer style kind of soundscape and it's it's incredible you know I don't fully understand classical still but you know you can appreciate just the sheer sort of monstrosity of it all you know you know um, I, I dig it because like I'm uh, when I'm not doing music um, movies, uh, you know, is, is my jam. I, I'm a massive film nerd, uh, and I spend way too much time watching films. And I think, you know, the, the like you say, you touched on like Hans Zimmer, John Williams, yeah, you know, probably two of the greatest uh, uh, composers. You know, the film score. You know, you go through things like Inception. Yeah, that uh, incredible soundtrack. Yeah, the, 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 the genius that is Tenet, um, where half the album is played when they play in it and when they put it down in the film, it's played backwards mm. uh, in time with the film. And it's just, yeah, it's just, just stuff like that. And I know in um, uh, June, for example, uh, they actually made up new instruments to make mm. new sounds. Yeah. This open world. So I think just, just going to that level, um, I think probably for Hans Zimmer personally, I, I think uh, the rock soundtrack, uh, yeah. impossible Two. Um, but then going into things like Inception was just pure class. Yeah, even like, um, oh, what's it called? The, I call it the Facebook film with Justin Timberlake. Does it the, what was it called? And it was um, Atticus Ross and was it Trent Reznor. What was it called? You know, the, it's, it was about Facebook, but it was like, yeah, Justin Timberlake, Hartman. What's it called? Like the social, the social, cool. was it? Uh, social network or something called that's it yeah yeah and I remember like actually you know Atticus Atticus Ross um, and Trent, I don't know if Hans Zimmer got involved in it but I remember the soundtrack for that was was, was quite good because again Trent Reznor I think he's incredibly talented not on just kind of like creating kind of like industrial electronica but he's a very talented composer um, you know even um, you know David Bowie kind of you know really admired Trent and kind of you know what he did but yeah going back to like you said you know you, you, you bought your guitar you said 12 what, what was you know your your first guitar, acoustic, electric, what was it? And I had a PV, I think it was a PV Raptor and a, and a PV Practica sound. Okay. And that was the, uh, the first one. And um, I went through a few, 
to be honest. Like, to, to you know, and, and it was just like, to start with, it was just because they look cool. Uh, yeah. you know, Fender uh, Stratocaster, uh, the, the, the ash wood finish because it was the the Springsteen yeah, style cool. g- g- guitar. Um, and then it turned out it was a Telecaster, so that was good. <laughs> um, but then I had, um, oh, God, I, I had a, a oh, about a couple of Gibsons, um, not not major ones, um, like your rapid phones and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but now I just well, then then I came across the uh, one of the Telecasters. And I remember the first time. And this is quite a way into the the No Good Sons journey. I think when I started No Good Sons, I had the Slash Custom Epiphone. Okay, yeah. Uh, crimson red. Uh, it was a beautiful piece of work. You know the Slash logo on the case and everything like that. So and I mm. bought that, and I bought. Uh, the amp and, and and the cab and stuff, um, and that's that that was all where that started. But then when I came across the Fender Telecaster, I was like, yeah, this is a bit alright, isn't it? Um, and I stuck with that since. So I've got um, like to this, I've got my Jason Isbell custom Tele. Let's have a look, uh, yeah. <laughs> nice, okay. This is just uh, I, I I was gonna get a Gibson Les Paul. Uh, so I was like, I'm finally gonna I'm finally gonna do it. I'm gonna get the Gibson Les Paul one. They are out of stock. Yeah. I was like, oh, man, you know, like, this sucks. It's going to take about like, three months to get here. So I didn't buy it. And literally the next day, um, Jason Isbell, who's the guy I preach about a lot. Yeah, he's, yeah. A, he's the greatest songwriter of our time right now. Um, he announced he teamed up with Fender and just released this this Telecaster. And I bought it there and then. I was like, I do not need to be sold anymore. <laughs> yeah. Jason Isbell Telly. Um so that's that's what I've used for a while, and then I finally Gibson. Um, got the Gibson Les Paul. Paul yeah. And uh, yeah, this was when I uh, when I got uh, COVID over Christmas. We we just done a uh, last year. We did a gig at the White Hart in Basingstoke. Yeah. And uh, and uh, <laughs> one by one, we all got the uh, the positive sign, and I developed uh, a new symptom during COVID, which was uh, impulsive guitar buying syndrome. Right. <laughs> And, I think uh, I'm, I'm all too familiar with that with our band. Yeah, they're always buying yeah. stuff. Yeah, and then two days later, uh, a Les Paul arrived on the doorstep. So, uh, yeah, uh, I use I use both. Uh, I mean, they're comp- like just from again, you know, I've heard you know Les Pauls or whatever SGs and you know Tellys or whatever. I mean, obviously different sounds, different pickups, different electronics, obviously different woods. I mean, talk to me about the the Telly. Uh, you know, the pickups. Uh, you know the strings you use, and obviously the the wood. You know why? Why kind of? I mean, do you have a preference over the Les Paul and the Tele, or no? It's, it's it, again, it depends on what we're playing, man. It's so like a lot of the ballad. He said the the, the the Les Pauls, like it's like it's bold, man. It's a Les Paul. It, it's in your face. It is there yeah. all the time. Um, string wise, I use Elevens. Uh, okay. Eleven and tens depends. Uh, to really, Elevens are my acoustic always because um, you get a deeper base of your sounds. Um, yeah. yeah. Actually, I was 11s to start with. Now on the uh, both of these, the, the Tele and the Les Paul uh, 10s, uh, again, just because, you know, the lighter gauge, you just get that brighter tone, you know, yeah. just a little edge closer to, to, to reaching mm. that big guns goal. Um, although he uses custom 7s <laughs> and a Mexican peso. I tend not to, 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 to mess around with them too much, man. Like, I'll probably use the uh, you know the the lower pickup and for the more sort of bluesy tracks. Yeah, I just want to get that sort of seventies blues, that Stevie Ray Vaughan esque like edging on. Um, whereas the, the the Les Paul again, you you send the pickups. So what are they again? Like so, on, go back to the telly. So on the telly, what are the pickups again? So is it like a Seymour Duncan? No, it's not a Seymour Duncan, is it? It's a is it a single coil pickup and single coil, yeah. I'm always up for being educated about other other things that I have very little sort of involvement yeah, with. When it comes to guitars, it's just like, how does it sound, and what's it going to sound like coming out of my amp if I have a, so what's, a little... Do you know the wood? So like the the what is like the neck? Is it a maple? Is it rosewood or uh, rosewood on the neck? Uh, uh, yeah, pretty sure that's uh, rosewood on that one. And what we've got on here, that's maple. Yeah, because again, like just obviously, like your Les Paul, your Gibsons, and your, your Fenders, obviously completely different sounds. Like generally, from 
what I understand and sort of heard, you know, your Gibsons are, are generally a bit more crunchy. Obviously, like your tellies, like classic, you know, you see like Keith Urban or, you know, most country artists, you know, use a telly because you kind of get that that twang uh, from it. It's quite, obviously, depending on your effects and your pickup setup and whatever, sort of, let's say, cleanish. And obviously, like your Strat sound, which I think. Now, I got this the wrong way around, I think, with Pete the other day. And I'm trying to remember which one, which way around they are. So, which one's more twangy? Is it your telly or your strap? I can't remember. I think the strap is more twangy. I, I, I like the, the the thing with the telly. I mean, yeah, your telly's um, <sighs> slightly Paisley. warmer sound. Yeah, he, Brad Paisley uses like the tellys. Don't yeah. he had a, a custom ones made up. Um, but I, I think you can definitely get a much nicer, cleaner tone out of the telly than you will uh, a strap. I remember okay. my strap, and it was just. Yeah, I, I much prefer the, the telly for the for the cleaner tone tracks, the ballads and stuff, the chilled vibes, the, the more you know country esque, and then verging into that seventies country rock. Yeah. Um, definitely use definitely use the telly man for that one. Whereas the Gibson, slightly heavier and crunchy. Yeah, yeah trying to get that cleaner tone out of it, it, it it's a bit it's difficult. Yeah. Like one of the tracks alternates between you know your, your, your cleaner, mellower, and then as it builds up. It, it goes into your head and it's just a nightmare trying to do that mm. live <laughs> just constantly <laughs> but I, yeah I um, I don't actually have a preference on them like, like I said it just depends on the song depends mm. on the feel of the vibe of the track and if I want to you know relay uh, the emotion through the song you've got to have the right guitar sound for it yeah uh, which I, I'll switch between between these two at some point uh i'll be introducing the acoustic to the sets as well so whilst martin's going off yeah um is it, what, what is it is it a taylor jackson uh, sigma i uh, sigma okay. guitar i use well, on the acoustics. again i've gone through a number of different brands and models tanglewoods um, yeah. and, and various numbers but um when i came across my first sigma i was like it's actually quite nice and I feel yeah not heard, not heard of that yeah and then so I've got a dreadnought hidden away, which uh, sadly yep. needs fixing. Um, and then this is the newest one, the aged um, half body, which is uh, yeah, it's a beautiful piece of work. The um, worn finish, it's uh, yeah, she's done all right this year, man. She's done all right, done a fair few gigs uh, with Colorado River, and uh, yeah, it's yeah. been good. So, I mean, you're obviously your guitars, your setups, I mean. Do you uh, go talk me through like your effects and, and things? What do you kind of obviously different pedals for different guitars and stuff? So what's your kind of yeah. pedal setup? So when I first started, right, I was like, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to be a pedal guy. I'm just going to like let let the amp do the work and then and then that'll be it. So I always had you know distortion on and that's the kind of vibe we were in. And then as we started sort of like maturing more as a band, I was like. Yeah, I'm gonna to have to invest in, in in some pedals, man. So um, what we have, I'll, I'll show you the pedal board, man. Let's yeah, yeah no, let's have a look. Flick it down and, and see. Let me know when you can see that. Okay, yeah, quite a simple. So what's that? Like a is that a, what's it called? A channel switcher on the left, or? Yeah, so we've basically got your uh, yeah your your, 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 your your switch that goes into the back of the uh, of your amp, and then um, Ibanez Tube Screamer. Um, yeah. Figma. It does exactly what it says. Uh, your your Figma uh, for your fuzz. Does it do like a little bit of dirty fuzz when you're doing that blue stuff? And then a simple delay and reverb again. Uh -huh. and, and track. Yeah. Um, and as soon as I will be getting a, a, a little A B switch coming in because then it's uh, less messing around when I need to switch between the guitars live. Yeah. Um, so uh, it is as simple as that. I oh, say so it's uh, quite a simple setup, really. Yeah, because I think whilst we're whilst I love doing, you know, I love all the different effects and stuff. You know, like I listen to all the stuff that uh, Mr. Pauly, um, our other guitarist, he he's got quite a unique uh, pedal board. You know, with your wire pedal and all that. But yeah. I'm predominantly just the you know rhythm guitar, um, and I'll go off and do some leads and stuff. Yeah. But like Martin, has got all these different effects pedals and stuff like that and but for me i just like to keep it as simple as possible yeah. because i just that that early blues rock that's where it, i think it really stems from i just like that simplicity of this is it you know you've got your distortion you've got your clean you've got a little bit of fuzz and, and i say the delay and the reverb for a couple of tracks but mm. to keep it as simple as possible 
Um, plus being the vocalist as well at the same time uh, when I'm trying to <laughs> do 101 pedals while yeah. trying to play. Um, yeah, keep it as simple as possible is what I try. And amp, amp, what do you go into? Like a solid state or is it a valve setup? Uh, valve, so I've got um, usually, I mean, this is my, my practice amp, Marshall Origin 20 combo, um, but I've got uh, a Marshall Origin uh, 2x12 and then the 50, Origin 50 head. Um, okay. Been Marshall for a while. I used to have an ABT advanced. Oh, man. What was it? It wasn't Valve, though. Um, and it was. I bought that as my first, yeah, it was my first amp and uh, and, and cab, actually. Uh, I, I bought it because a guy was, was having a kid. Um, I needed one on the cheap because I was also having a kid. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I bought this one from uh, from the student Southampton for like 200 notes, and it did the job for, for quite a few years. And then when I wanted to start getting, you know, not relying on just one single, you know, tone, I needed to start venturing a little bit out there and, and using different pedals and stuff and getting pedal boards. So sticking with Marshall, did, did a fair bit of homework, you know, listening out for like, you know, the sounds and what I like to, what I like, what I want to hear. Mm. Um, and yeah, the Origin series, I saw the 20 combo uh, when our drummer used to work at a local music shop and it was in there. Oh, I'll just have a quick go on that. I fell in love with that straight away. So yeah. that when, when it came to gigging, I was like, ah, probably want to get something a little bit more juicy and then mm. just straight away had a look at the 50 heads and was just like yeah that'll do me and yeah it's been um been doing the tours ever since as it will tonight so you've always what been a, a marshall fan because obviously i know like uh, you know a lot of you know people depending on what bands they listen to when they were younger and things and that kind of amp sound you know you know, like you go back, you know, a long time ago. So go back to like early, I'm not talking about bass as well, but going back to like early Trace Elliott's, High Watt and, and Carlsbro and, and things like that. You know, obviously you don't really get any Carlsbro stuff really. But um, yeah, everyone's got their preference and sound and obviously Valve, Solid State. And obviously you get a lot of amps now, which are Solid State and they like, you know, Valve simulation. And they sound quite obviously close to a Valve sound. So you're never going to, it's a lot, again, like final and CD, you know, you're never going to get that valve true valve sound out of a solid state and obviously vice versa um but again it's yes yeah, just, just preference and, uh, and, and and things like that but yeah marshall is kind of you know that's always been your let's say first love but that's kind of what yeah, you yeah i think my uh, my old man he was a guitarist and he was in a band in london back in back in the day and he always used marshall and i think growing up he was always just like oh you want to stick to marshall and stuff and i think mm -hmm. it's just kind of you know, stuck ever since. I've used like the orange um, brands as well, uh, Vox as well, but I think it's just Marshall Valve, man. You just can't beat that sound. It's just got that old school sound to it, yeah. which is definitely what I want to try and keep. Um, you said about like you're getting, um, you know, you said earlier about sort of, you know, as every guitar player does, you know, buying new guitars. You know, have you got any uh, an eye on anything sort of in particular at the moment or, you know, what's your next... Well, you know, electric purchase going to be? I don't know. The next one's probably going to be um, probably electric acoustic. You know, I like my Sigmas, but I've always I've always had a, a keen eye for for the Martins. Yeah, Martins um, are nice. Yeah, are pretty pretty good. You know, they're good for a reason. Um, I know Springsteen uses the older Takamines as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. But I would probably go Martin. But other than that, not really looking looking for a new one. Um, you know, I've got my two babies. Uh, there's no way I'd trade, you know, the, the, the Jason Isbell custom. Like, mm. It's just, you know, done for me. And then having yeah. the Les Paul is the main one. I, those are the two guitars that I probably always wanted. Now I've got them. It's just like, I oh, don't need to window shop no more, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, how, how would you say, you know, from the early days, of, you know, being 12 and, and sort of now, how would you say, not necessarily just your playing style has changed, but I guess sort of, um, I guess like sort of musical intellect and sort of musical maturity. How would you say kind of your playing's, you know, oh, drastically, man. you know, change? Is there anything kind of you've really learned, you know, something valuable you've learned, <coughs> excuse me, kind of recently or, you know, what, what, so at what point, I guess what I'm trying to say is at what point do you think your playing changed and you kind of almost like a light bulb moment, you know? Um, definitely like, you know, playing with the No Good Sons really. Upped it. I had to up it, you know. Um, I had to up it a lot. 
and then when you when you're playing with the likes of you know Mike Martin and and Simon, you you want to be top of your game, right? So like being in the studio every week, just watching a few uh, little licks that that Martin will do and stuff, and and we've really pushed ourselves on on the last you know couple of albums, but especially you know before Sin Reprisal came out. Mm. Uh, when we were going through the notions of recording that and, you know, done Revelations of a Whiskey Soaks Pass. And I remember being in the studio, getting my guitar tracks down, but I I practised and practised and practised. And, and that's really when it started to change. And I knew that, okay, Sin Reprise was done, but I now, if I want the next album of No Good Sons to be even better, well, I'm going to have to be even better. I'm going to have to learn some new licks and have to do some new tricks um, and just learn my trade a little bit more when I'm playing. Goes the same thing with playing live. Um, you know, I, I've the, the 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 confidence meter. You know, from from when I first started playing, and it was just like, just play the guitar, man. Just you know, I, I learned to sing and, and play guitar, and then that's it. But now my live performance compared to like three years ago, completely different. It's just okay. difficult to get yeah. me off the black stage now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess like there's some, you know, uh, gigs you play where you kind of, it just all sort of, you know, it all just, put, you know, fit, fit together, you know, it all just kind of, it just worked. You know, there's some gigs you play where you go, oh, all right. And other gigs where like, I know we did a gig at, um, Black Deer Festival earlier in the year, and uh, I think you were at that, weren't you? Oh, well, I was just about to say, I was front and centre for that. And, like, after after we did that gig, I, I don't know what it was. I don't think it's necessarily, like, an arrogance thing, because I, I, I mean, personally, and, you know, I think other people said, well, you know, I think, like, we're quite a humble band. I don't, you know, we're not really kind of, like me as a musician or whatever, you know, I don't think we're like really a show off band or, or anything like that, you know? Yeah. So, you know, a, definitely a, a musician's band. I think, mean, you know, going back to like evolution and stuff like that, you know, since Pete banjo, I call him sort of banjo, lap steel, pedal steel, PV power, slide, flute, guitar, but like, like anything, you know, since he joined, I was saying about upping your game, you know, me and Dave had to up our game. I think, you know, I've definitely, you know, improved as a musician. Again, you know, you play more gigs, you get tighter and things like that. But like just, you know, the musicality of the band when Pete joined just completely, completely changed. Our double bass player left um, and just, yeah, the dynamic of the band as a trio, you know, is, is say, not like the can Alexa, you know, but just, yeah, the dynamic just sort of changed yeah. and just became a lot more cohesive and things. But yeah, the Black Deer gig, we just came off and it wasn't like, obviously, you practice, you kind of prepare for gigs as, as, as anyone sort of does. Like, you know, if you're going for a mar doing a marathon, like Pete does a lot of marathons, you know, you've got to prepare, you've got to train and stuff like that. Um, but like we just played, we just went on stage, did our thing, and it just all kind of works. Like I said, some days it not it doesn't work, but just it just felt really just great. We came off and I was like, I think that's probably the best gig we've done. Like obviously having a great crowd makes a big difference. Yeah. Um it's like one of the best gigs we've done in you know all year, you know, or the past couple of years actually. And I was like, it just worked, you know, we've had a great time and um you know, Dave put in a couple of licks here, I put in a couple of cheeky fills here, or and he, you know did a couple of licks on his uh, on his pedal steel and it's just like yeah you get little moments of kind of when i say genius it's like the more you gig the more comfortable you can kind of almost go off the the kind of track and just kind of yeah you know put in a couple of licks here and there and it's and that just comes yeah i said with practice and practice and just gigging um regularly but yeah you gotta up your game almost every time you know you want you know get bigger and better as a band yeah you got up your game not just live but like i said you know in, in the studio but it's also like we recorded um at the old chapel um for the second and yeah first and second album and you know it's a great it's in uh, nutball and chichester way so it's great studio really really good david evans the engineer producer you know he's very um again very kind of clever because he's a musician himself and that helps if you're a musician and you're uh, like a producer, like I interviewed Adam Box, uh, the Brothers Osborne drummer, and he's like has his own studio in Nashville. So like you know, being a musician and a producer, it just kind of it just helps. But yeah, like he was just really good and kind of like what did I call him? Like a personal trainer for musicians. Like he literally like that's not good enough. Do it again. Do it again. That does, you know, it's not like a personal thing. It's just you know he wants it to sound because his name's on it effectively. 
you know, his name's on it. He wants it to sound as good as possible, and he wants obviously the, the record to sound as as good as possible. And, you know, the second album had you know a lot more time. Not even luxury, you know, time wasn't a luxury. It was just we spent a lot more time on the songs, the production of the songs, you know, um, doing all these different takes, trying different sounds out and things. And just like, you know, you spend more time on it, you just create, you know, you just create a better a better product. And I think, yeah, going into a studio well rehearsed um, and into a good studio with a good engineer and a producer, good, you know, a good desk, good preamps and all that stuff, you know, good kind of vintage gear like i played on like some old like vintage ludwigs and slingle and stuff you know obviously as well as my, my you know the gear i use um but yeah you've always got to be upping your game and it's kind of like a not say sadly it's you know being in a band it is a bit like you know being in the premier league in a way you know it's kind of um it is a bit of a, a competition amongst bands yeah. as, as such you know it's difficult i mean i don't know it's a kind of what's the word to kind of separate that from i don't know what am i trying to say like you've got you know you'll normally have like a circle of bands that you play with who you're kind of pals with which i think you know it's really good that kind of community um but i mean i guess probably actually when i was in union southampton like big indie scene and i was into all that stuff and whatever but i think like like in the indie scene like your kind of razor lights and libertines or, or whatever you know that i think was a very tough scene to be in because yeah i think everyone definitely was competing against each other you know as opposed to with but i think kind of in the country scene americana rock i don't know yeah just there's i think definitely much more of a, of a community in the kind of yeah i guess rock americana so i don't know uh side of things which is, which is good you know because you gotta kind of help each other on your way up or, or, or wherever you know um yeah but i think sticking together being having a community of different bands you know i think it's it's good it just it's good for the scene i think um, uh, yeah, i agree i think you know, but it's we've, difficult it's not easy we've got like a, a a couple of groups that we always you know like we got a gig do you want to get on that or do you want to come with us and stuff and you're a pay the favor and stuff and i think it's right i think when you get into the realms of like is it a competition and it's just like ah, I think you master your craft first, right? Yeah, that's, you know, master your craft and, and then, but just enjoy it. And I think mm. there's the fine line between competition and then you do meet bands when you're out there that it, you're clearly doing what they can to, to get where they want to go, you know, mm. and I, I 100% respect that. Um, but for me, it's just about, it's about having a crack, it's about having a good fun, you know, it's about mm. having a good time. You said something earlier that really resonates with me about the crowd. The crowd's the most important thing. You feed off the crowd when you're playing. If the yeah. crowd are quiet, you do your gig and it's glorified brand practice. But if the crowd are up for it and yeah, you're really, you know, you're really getting them involved and engaged, uh, you are able to just be you and 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 do your yeah. thing. Like I said, put in those extra fills, you know, tease the audience a little bit with some new stuff and, and whatnot. And and I think that really helped the crowd is the most important thing at every gig, without a doubt. It it, it the crowd determines you know how you're going to perform i remember when we supported the choir boys at sub 89 and um we we went on and all the house lights were on i couldn't see a damn thing you know i was proper nervous and then um yeah i just said like right we got any no good sons fans out there expecting like one little voice yeah. to come back and then, yeah. um and but the whole the whole venue just went nuts and mm. i'm like i was not expecting that response and, and then when the lights sort of died down you could see how many people yeah. yeah and it was just and again we did our thing the crowd really got engaged we were engaged and, and it was just yeah it was awesome huh? one of the best shows we've done we've done a couple recently you can tell we're just itching to, to get back doing more live gigs again um, there's a lot of pent up just uh, waiting to burst out after lockdown and everything like that but I'm really glad yeah, it took a while for the music scene to get back up and running after after the whole COVID stuff Mm -hmm. uh, with venues we're, like, well, we're not sure if we're going to do gigs yet you know because of like crowds and stuff but it's in full swing now again uh which is awesome to see you know obviously you guys are out on the road quite a lot at the moment we've got a fair bit coming up and it's just nice to see that the the, the fans uh, and the crowds want to come back to, to to the music like black deer we were we were at and that was uh that, that was really busy um obviously i was there uh, I'm, I'm out of the band with 
weren't playing there. Um, and then Long Road Festival as well, we went to um, not so long ago. And again, just the crowds were just totally up for live music again, mm. which is awesome. I think it's still, it's still uh, tough. I think like any kind of, um, you know, notes of recovery, I still think are maybe not in, in, it, in its kind of infancy, but I kind of think still... I don't know, I'm not being sort of uh, a negative Nancy, but just kind of, there's still elements of, like, prematurity with with the scene, because obviously, you, got, you know, friends of mine who've got venues and stuff and promoters who've just packed it in, because it's, you know, it is expensive, and, uh, uh, and you know, because effectively, you know, you're in a band, you know, it's like going to work, you know, you've got you've to get paid for it. Um, and, you know, some venues can't afford to pay as much, you know, you still do it, but it's just, it is still... It is difficult, you know. Obviously, bands um, uh, calling it a day because it's just too expensive to do, or just kind of, you know, yeah, the, sort of the money's not there. And the thing is, like, we don't do it for the money. Obviously, getting paid is is good, you know. You get play a gig, get paid, get fed, watered, whatever hotel, great. Um, but yeah, it is still it's a slog, you know. It is you've got to. It's kind of with anything, you know. You've got to really graft, you know. And it's not a case of it's harder graph now than it was twenty years ago, but maybe so. But yeah, it is. Yeah, you gotta. It's the whole age old, you know. Whatever you put in, you'll you'll get out. Reap what you sow, and it's just you gotta put the work in. And uh, uh, and you know, I think I think anyone would probably agree. There's probably moments you'll get of slight kind of despondency and kind of you know, oh, is this really worth it? But really, like I said, you kind of get together with your bandmates. You know, like Pete and Dave. You know, they're great great people you know i love them uh you know i love hanging out with them getting drunk or whatever um and just writing music playing music you know gigging even like the 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 kind of the say the crap stuff like when we did a wildfire festival in scotland pete was in um he's in stockholm like for work and um ba had cancelled his flights and uh they're basically like you can either pay x amount to come home or uh you can wait for like come home in two weeks or something it's like Pete was like well we got a gig tomorrow in Scotland so you know he paid his money whatever and so yeah he he went back to Wimborne he got home at, at, in Wimborne so it's like you know uh Bournemouthish way um about midnight so me and Dave got the van drove down to, to pick Pete up at about yeah midnight hit the road at about half 12 drove to Scotland through the night I think we got to Scotland about half eight stayed in one of those service station hotel things uh did the gig at was it two o'clock hung around till about five went home the hotel you know and i think we hit the sack about seven thirty eight o'clock or whatever you know didn't manage to catch the, the 10 o'clock news and just, just hit hit the hit the sack up in the morning down to oldham for a gig and yeah pete was absolutely not i mean i was quite tired but yeah it's like the things you do kind of for, for for rock and roll i guess it's all it's all worth it you know it's it's fun you know you do it for the love of of music and, uh, and, 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 you know, so it's kind of sometimes you've got to put the whole money and I don't know, thing, thing aside. Um, and just, you, yeah, you do it for, for the love. But like I said, it's, it's, it is a, a difficult, um, yeah, industry to be in, you know, music, but yeah, like I said, you just, you know, you meet some great people along the way and it just, it just makes it, makes it all worthwhile. And also like the people you meet, you know, you're, I don't call them fans anymore, I call them friends. We've got so many people who are like really close friends of ours. We've got a guy called Mike who uh, he works for Man United doing hospitality and things. And um, I don't think he's followed us from day one, but he's followed us from uh, like before we, you know, he hasn't followed us when we were under a different moniker, but he's followed us for, you know, for quite a while. And basically now he just does our, you know, he's got all the PR things sorted, booking. So basically what his idea is, I'm going to do this and this, all the admin stuff, so you can focus on being a good band and 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 and, and writing music, you know. So um, and you know, he's a very a very good friend of mine, you know. He's he's coming to my wedding in October and stuff. So so yeah, you make you meet a lot of good people, and like I said, you make some good friends, and you know, they keep coming to your gigs. It's like what was it when I went to the Cadillac Three in the Roundhouse for my birthday? Was it last Tuesday, Tuesday before? They literally said, you know, if you keep coming you know, we'll keep playing. And that's it, you know, people just keep yeah. buying our stuff. I, don't, I have no idea why, but um, people keep coming to gigs and it's not a case of how big you are, how small you are, or, you know, there's no no real point in kind of quantifying your, uh, yeah, how good or not you are. You know, it's just 
a journey, really, music and being yeah. in a band. People that come back, it's just like they know they're going to have a good time. And I think that's the thing. You know, you and I, we're not in this to, to make money, right? We're musicians, uh, unless you're playing in, in the big league yeah. uh, and getting, you know, billions of streams every year. Uh, but so, it, it, so, so the money's aside, right? It's just about having the crack, having a good time, connecting with fans, as you mm. said, friends that they've yeah. become. Uh, same situation. We've got so many people that we've met that we're just really good mates with now. Um, who, who come and do all sorts? You know, we've we, you know, we've got like Laura uh, Martin's over half that, that does all our photography, uh, and and she's do, do you know started up uh, you know her her little photography firm and stuff. And then you've got you know the likes of you know we've got a mate Christian that that one day just said, oh you know really really love you guys, and and you know got any time you need a van and and do a drive. So he's got himself a no good son's uh, roadie t shirt. Because he's our driver uh, for for gigs when he can. You know, it's just people like that that just come up and just really enjoy it. And I think, like it, again, like you just said, it's people keep coming back, and sometimes we just don't know why. But we're obviously doing yeah, something definitely. right. And if it's portraying like you know, good music, having a good time, you know, you're gonna have a couple of beers, see some friends and some people that you haven't seen since the last gig. Um, I think for me, that's what it's about. It's about giving people that opportunity to have a good time. Mm. and that's that's what i dig and if you get to do that whilst playing music which you love then it's a, it's a double win you get yeah. to do what you and, and get, getting paid for doing what you absolutely love is a very i think that's a luxury yeah. really and it's very lucky you know you and i the sort of position we're in and pete pete says this a lot and and i kind of um yeah i um i stick by he said we're you know ordinary people doing like extra extraordinary things because i mean you know you got your day job i've got mine you've probably got yours and stuff like that you've got a family i've got a family you know but outside of that it's just you know yeah it, it's kind of sometimes I, I sort of pinch myself some of the gigs and things we do it's like you know even if you're just doing a pub gig or, or, or whatever you know just getting to play music and i think get paid for it is kind of it, it, I think, <laughs> handy but incidental um yeah it's just uh yeah a very lucky you know, uh, thing, you know, that, that, that we get to do sort of every week, you know, going into a studio, like, you know, just having the relationship that you have with your bandmates. And like I said, just the, 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 the sort of the ups, uh, and the downs, like when we did Scotland, I think we were so hungry at like seven o'clock and it was like, all we could smell was like really stale Burger King. So we'd like, that was literally kind of like the, <laughs> the, the only option. Uh, and that, you know, that was sort of, a bit awful although the drive up we had to stop off some petrol or a diesel or whatever and because the other two are veggie they bought me this hack because i love scotland and whiskey or whatever um they got me like this haggis pie and it, honestly oh, i was yeah. so hungry and it was like it was incredible and they had like a mac and cheese thing but it was so good but um and like scotland's incredible i love the the scenery the people and like so we did we done winter storm festival in in troon which is northwest coast um I think it's a bit further north than Inverness but on, yeah that side that's a good festival you should do if, if you get to it because we played and like we got to like chat to like Skid Row and who else oh, played I can't remember there's loads of really cool oh Diamond Head you know when we went back to the hotel we hung out with Diamond Head bloody got to chat to um old Pete Way you know UFO um you know so he conked it this year but yeah we got to hang out with Pete Way when was Winston 10 19 or something just at a you know and uh and I remember the story that Dave gave us was he sort of uh, chatted to Pete a bit and, uh, and yeah, you know, because the Pete Way band played. And, um, and what was it? He said something to Dave like, um, you know, I'm I'm pleased to know and talk to to Dave from the Outlaw. So it's like, I was like, okay, you know, he probably doesn't really know us that way. I think he watched us, actually, because we played um, Custom Rock and Blues in Derby. I think he played that same gig we did the, the same day so it's kind of like little kind of amazing things you just pinch yourself and you think kind of you know pete way i mean he's done it you know obviously had a, a rough a rough journey you know um but like ufo like one of the biggest kind of rock bands of their time and just kind of just to talk to someone in sort of my opinion kind of rock rock royalty uh it's just incredible you know and like i said it's such an extraordinary life that kind of we live and lead outside of our not monotonous normal life but do you know what i mean it's just it's yeah. such a, a it's, it is a privilege and I, I, you know and anyone who kind of disagrees i think you know 
like I said, as much as it's hard work and sometimes you think, oh, what's the point? It's a privilege, you know, you don't get to do it every day, you know, other people. Yeah, I, you know, I, I say all the time that sometimes I actually take it for granted what we do. Yeah, it's easy to do that, yeah. Everybody can play an instrument, everybody can write a song from scratch and then take it to the studio and, and build it up. And, mm. and then when you're listening to the albums and stuff, and you know, it's the same thing with, with, with my other lot, uh, Colorado River. Um, when we do the acoustic country stuff, man, and it's just you know just sitting there writing, having a couple of wh whiskeys and stuff, and and just building it up, and then you just think, yeah, not everyone does this, you know. <laughs> and when you talk about it in public, uh, and and people are just like, wow, that's that's mental, you know. Yeah. Again, it is a skill, it is a talent, uh, and we're blessed to have that and be able to actually use that yeah. to entertain people, and it's important not to take that for granted. It yeah, so it's easy to do it, but you know, um, yeah. we've kind of gone off not off the beaten track, um, but <laughs> I kind of wanted one thing I wanted to touch on, and this is kind of not say for my own sanity, but other people. So, as, as a musician from 12 to now, would you say you were predominantly, uh, you know, theory based or self taught? Self taught, um. <laughs> You know, I'll just now I'm in those realms where I can just listen to it, and then I'll just try and work it out, and mm. uh, and then I'll, I'll I'll find new ideas just from you know watching bands or or watching Mr. Paulie go off on one in the studio on his guitar. Yeah. And, um, so yeah, it, it's and again by no feat am I uh, it, my guitar skills are just my guitar skills, man. That's yeah. it. Uh, at a certain level, am I going to get better? Yeah, I'm going to keep playing. So the more mm. I play, the better I'm going to get. I'm going to pick up new riffs, new licks, and all of that, and then I'm going to write a whole bunch of new stuff based on all of that, you know, <laughs> and it, it take it to the next level. Um, just going to keep doing that, man. Right? You know, I keep keep learning, keep listening, keep keep watching stuff, and, and keeping an eye out for, for for different different ways of playing, uh, just to you know earn that craft, take it to the next gen. Do you have, um, and we'll talk about vocals a bit in a, in a minute because I kind of do some backing vocals, whatever. Um, do you have any like um, disciplines as a guitar player? And also, like, do you, uh, do you warm up, you know, at a gig, you know, pre gig and warm down? Do you, yeah, you know? Fine, man. I'll have a little jam. Uh, so I'll, uh, I'll I, I tend to uh, uh, do a couple of ZZ Top and Aerosmith licks just to, to get the fingers going yeah. and, and, and wandering. Um, and I, I think it's important, you know, I, it's, it's I probably should do some vocal warm ups, which is why I always like end up with a haggard voice after the next day. Mm, so yeah. that's one thing I do need to start doing as well mm. is, is, is the good guitar. But yeah, I am um, always like, even today, we got a gig tonight. I, you know, I've got the gear out, but anytime we're doing a gig, I'll tend to to spend about half hour just yeah. uh, warming up, doing some, some little practices. Obviously, we're in the studio every week. Yeah. Uh, every Monday, me and the boys, you know, we go and meet up. But still, I'll probably just like, you know, I need to. I'll write down right. I just need to work on the middle eight for that bit, but I just need to like yeah. add, add an extra fill on that bit, and and just work on it during the week. So I'm quite disciplined when it comes to guitar, especially when we come to recording. Like I'm. Yeah, yeah. It's, that's yeah. You got to be well aware of myself. And if there's if there's a bend that's slightly off, or I mean. <laughs> It used to be when he did the first album, you know, Martin would be used to doing his magic in the production and he'd be like, right again, right again, right again, right, mm -hmm. you're going to try do it this way and this way and this way. Um, and uh, the progression of, of my music, I can tell because I'm going into the studio for album number two and specifically album number three. Mm -hmm. And I'd be the one saying, no, no, do it again. No, I want to start again. No, mm -hmm. I need to do this. Or, I don't, we're going to try that. Um, so I could tell there's a different, definite progression there. Uh, and mm. that discipline really coming in. But if I don't like it, I don't I don't want other people to hear it if I don't mm. like it. Um, so I get very, very strict on myself. Very, I, I, I'm the first one to put myself down and be self-critical. I think, yeah, you're always, you know, self-critical. I think, like I said, when you have a bad day at gig, it's always like, you think you had a crap gig and everyone thinks, you know, the crowd thing, that's great. You think, yeah, you kind of, it's, it's a really difficult thing to go, Oh yeah, it's all right, you know. Oh, thanks, you know. But it's kind of in your mind. It's like you know, you think you had a bad gig, but other people really enjoy it. It's, it's, it's weird because you, you never, you know, you never know how good or not you know you sound out out, out front. You know, um, you know, it's, and, until you get like the luxuries of having your own touring sound engineer, monitor engineer, whatever. 
Um, but yeah, going to the whole practice thing, like um, when I was talking to Adam from Brothers Osborne, um, he, I asked him about practice. He doesn't really sort of warm up, you know, like normally we, we had a little sort of challenge. So right, okay, next time we, you know, we hook up or whatever, you know, I want to hear him saying, yeah, I practice. And he wants to hear me saying, yeah, I, I sort of warmed up before the gig. Um, but all the, like the warm ups always three pints and like literally, and Dave is guilty of it and he always tries to kind of steer away from it. Is but everyone wants to talk to you before a gig and afterwards, you know, and you're always trying to save your voice and things like that. You want to go away, you know, practice. But the thing is, it's like as a band, you know, you're, and uh, you know, as, as people in the band, you know, it's a bit like I, I say I'm the same, you know, very sociable. It's a very sociable thing and it's kind of, you want to, you know, hang out and talk to people, but you don't want to be rude and be like, right, you know, I'm sort of, I'll see you later, I'll see you after the gig, and you want to take yourself away and, 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 and you know, the practice pad or whatever. Um, but I'm my, not really a challenge uh, and, you know, New Year's resolution, whatever, but I'm going to try and endeavour to, because I've got a practice pad, you know, and just really, because slates for me, Again, it's like warming up for a run. It's, you know, you don't want to get a stitch mid gig. You know, you sort of want to be feel limber and loose and stuff like. That. So for me, it'd be like more for feeling, you know, loose and kind of, I guess, it's stamina, speed, and sort of, you know, consistency and things. Um, like I bought a double pedal recently. Now, like it's funny when I used to when I was at um, uni, like before uni, I used to go to church and whatever. Um, so I did this Christmas gig with the, the church that I went to. And um, got some guys together, and I was like, "Look, let's do like a metal version of Oh Come All Ye Faithful." And it wasn't a metal version. Basically, what it was is me playing drums with a double pedal. Didn't really understand how how to use it because really double pedal. Say from a guitar point of view, it's quite difficult because you know you get obviously some bands, you know, say Slipknot or whatever, you know, or whoever, you know, double pedal where you've got like throughout the whole song, it's like it's like I I can't do that speed, you know, at, at all. And it's for me, double pedal, back then I was just like, just flamming all the time or whatever. But I bought one recently, I traded in my single pedal uh, hammer speed cobra thing and I got a DW5000 uh, series double pedal. I remember years ago when I first had a double pedal, I was like, what really annoyed me was you got like a link bar and that link bar um, is basically like a minimum sort of distance apart from the main pedal and like, the slave. And always, you know, it, it puts the hi-hat a bit further away from your snare. And I remember I just got really annoyed that my hi-hat was a bit further away because I like my hi-hat to kind of effectively, you've got your snare there, the hi-hat kind of symbol. It's sort of a little, you know, so it's just easy just to cross over whatever. Um, but no, I got it. And we did like a gig at the County Music Bar uh, last week and because Rocking the Bowl, I don't know if you've heard of that festival, it's, you know, in Sheffield, they cancelled it this year because, like, you know, really bad ticket sales. And they were saying about festivals and promoters packing it in because it's you know tough um so we did this gig for them you know we did it as a all the bands got together did it as a favor because like i said the rock community is quite you know quite strong um but yeah and i had the double pedal and you know when we do like come together you know we do our cover of the beatles tune or rocky mount can we do rocky mountain where i can't remember i think we have anyway i think i'd use it more for like color and sort of just a bit of a different vibe rather than kind of just doing a kind of like, I don't know, like a, it's just kind of, I don't know, it doesn't, for me, I don't think it suits the music. I think it's good to do, you know, to have it as like a, just a bit of an extra thing, but I'm a bit, while well, I was going back to about being like a purist, like I love Bonham, a bit of a cliche thing to say, because it's like, oh, was your favourite drummer, Bonham or, or, or Jeff Picaro, you know, Picaro or, or Keith me, whatever. Um, you know, for me, it's like the things he can do with his foot, I can't do. With, with with you know i kind of need a double pedal to do it you know so i'm kind of like i never wanted to get a double pedal because i want to go right i want to do these quadruplets or triplets on a single pedal i don't want to because i kind of feel right you could do a triplet really easy with a double pedal and make it sound great but for me i thought i want it to sound great just with my basic setup you know kick drum and, and, and whatever um so yeah i think like kind of double pedal can make a standard fill sound amazing but i'm kind of want to use it like i said just just I guess it's kind of like it's something a bit dangerous double pedal you know it's a bit risky um but if you kind of get the the what's the word the timing between each one so they're consistent it can sound really really quite good but yeah so um so I'm going to get a, like a, a double pedal kick drum uh practice pen up and just you know cuz it's really if you really want to go really fast like cuz how I kind of used to learn cuz I'm self-taught is I'd want to do something 
really quickly. I wouldn't want to learn it. You know, I'd just be like, oh, no, I can do it. But you can't, you know. But it's really easy to to, to flam, which is kind of like, you know, if you, you know, typically. So if you're doing like a hi-hat snare and like a, just a standard kind of like, like kick drum, or like on the, you know, it's really easy to kind of hit the snare drum just before the kick drum or just after. It just doesn't sound. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit of a, like you said, a, your, your own worst critic. But, yeah. um, especially for craft, right? Yeah, so. yeah, but yeah, I'm self taught like you, you know, just listening to anything from Slayer to Buddy Holly to Abba to I don't know, Justice or you know, or, I think you know, having a very taste in music, I think that helps as, as a musician, you know, having a very, you know, broad, you know, obviously Zeppelin, The Who, Cream, and Clapton, and whatever, you know, but yeah, I love like just love drums, you know, I love, but like I, said, I love guitar but like because when i go to a gig i'm not obviously i watch the drummer but i do like to watch the, the the double you know the bass player the guitar player kind of what amps have they got and kind of if you get close enough the pedal board and and things like that i just like i said i've just got a fascination for it and you know but a long time ago bands are you know very when you know pv were kind of a you know good old-fashioned kind of uk company um you know the kind of all the electronics were you know built in the uk and like trace elliott because i think at one point pv bought trace elliott so they they are Trace Elliots, but they're kind of PV. Um, some people from Trace Elliot went over to PV. Again, like kind of, I don't know, who else am I thinking of? Carlsborough, I think they were English. And then I think they got bought out by a Japanese company. So the electronics were Japanese. But I don't know. I'm just very interested in in, in, in all that kind of thing. So like Dave has an orange dual chair, which he doesn't use. He uses like a little box. You would have seen it. It's like a tiny little box thing. It's, uh, it's not a valve. It's got like a valve simulate. I don't know. It's great. It's like about 15 watt, 20 watt. And it's incredible for a tiny little thing. It's brilliant, you know. And I, I do like Vox. You know, Vox are, again, kind of that kind of, you know, British kind of, I call it like a Beatles sound. I don't know. I just love the sound of Vox. I love the sound of Orange. Um, I quite like uh, the brand. I like Engel. I love it. I think Engel's are, they're Scandinavian. I think they're Swedish or something. But yeah, Engel, because the band I used to be in at uni, one band I was in, is crazy. They were like, um, no vocals or anything. It was just basically purely instrumental. Um, you know, kind of Rush meets XTC meets, I don't know. It was just weird, but but great. You know, the time signatures, I can't really tell you what they were. But again, it's all kind of like muscle memory. And just remember playing and like the guitar player, Greg, he had like an angle head and an angle cab. It was great. It was loud. And it was crunchy. And he had all these, you know, like Digitech whammy. You know, he had all those kind of things, a load of really cool delays and reverbs and whatever. Um, but yeah, I just love guitar effects. I love like one of my favorite guitar brands. I said, I'm never going to play guitar, but there's a brand, look him up, called Lucky Dog based can't remember where where in america but just the craft on 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 the on the guitars it's like he subcontracts out a lot of like the leather work so like the edge of the guitar you'll have like some really intricate kind of leather work you might have like a, a leathered um you know like a leather scratch plate and i just love what they do with just look them up the finishes are incredible they're just yeah, and, they, yeah. and they and they look amazing and they sound great like there's you know um you know you're looking at i don't know minimum three and a half, four thousand dollars maybe. Um, but they're honestly they're incredible. And they're kind of like got that telly telly shape. Um I think yeah, majority of like the necks are like rosewood and things. But yeah, they're just great guitars and they sound amazing. Um but yeah, I just I just love gear. I love, you know, even going into a studio and stuff. Like I did popular music studies and record production at uni. Um and we had a guy called Trevor Horn, again looking up very, very big, big name in, in, in sort of music production and stuff um and he was just talking to us like about neve and stuff like that and like the analog desk and, and you know i just love it because i used to do sound engineering when i was at, uh, in london before you oh, cool. so i just love it all it's just such just literally what i like is the whole picture it's not just being a drummer it's you know it's kind of like what makes a band you know how is an album recorded how does it all come together it's just really fascinating and i think not everyone not necessarily appreciates but really understands the kind of the complexities and the all the different working elements of a band you know how it all happens because it's just you know it's not just getting in a car going to a venue and playing a gig there's just so many elements of how that all kind of you know comes together and like recording an album it's so complicated 
you know, there's so many different avenues and, you know, you go to a big studio, small studio, uh, yeah, analog desk, non-analog. I mean, he had, um, David had a Roland tape echo from maybe 70s, 80s, and basically you lift up the lid and it's like a reel of cassette tape just going round and round, going round these kind of two rotors, just going like that. And, and that was like analog reverb and honestly delay or whatever and it was great i was like jeez it was so i yeah i just love it you know that's uh, yeah yeah i kind of do you know when we go to gigs and stuff i'll always go down to the front have a little nose and see what what's there but again when I, one day we'll get to that billy gibbons level where he's got he doesn't have his pedal board out the front he's got a guy out the back doing the pedals for him um <laughs> you know and it's just like that's where i want to be <laughs> one day. Well, um, <laughs> or you have a, or you have a Kemper because Pete uses a Kemper, so he doesn't have any amp. He, you know, all his preamps and everything is set up. It's all in his Kemper. I've, it's, I think you know he's got like a pedal board version. He used to have like a rack um, mounted version. I think it's great. You know, he's got all his, you know, his volume control and stuff. You know, it's just, it's just so easy. No amp, and it's just. I think Pete tried to convince Dave maybe to to go camp but i think dave's a bit old school he likes the cabs and, and you know as much as he doesn't have a, a stack or anything he just likes old-fashioned head and he, head and cab but i think kemp is great just minimizes volume on stage and and kind of that's my um mentality on what i use so i'm not going to go into it too much because it'll probably bore you but um so like uh the symbols i use are quite trashy they're not bright at all, like your, your A custom Zildjian's, you know, so they're quite quite trashy, more, again, for colour, texture. Um, I use these things called, um, uh, I don't know if I've got any nearby, no. Um, it's a company called Simpad, and they basically make this high-density um, foam. So, like, you get on, like, say, on your top of your symbol, you have, like, a, a felt wa um, sort of yeah. washer. Um, but, yeah, these are high-density foam. But I use something on the bottom, which is called, like, a moderator. So, basically, if you imagine the bell of a symbol... <laughs> these um these round discs as such they sit on the bottom of the bell so what they do is they support the symbol a lot better but also they they don't kill the tone what they do is they kind of yeah they lower the volume effectively so from the bell outwards it just kind of sort of neutralizes as such any harsh sound so like for my slightly more lively symbols i'll use like a, a slightly wider diameter like an 80 mil i've got like a sandblasted uh symbol i use a company called Daryl who endorsed me um that's a bit quieter so i'll use like a 70 mil because obviously i want to still get a bit of volume um but even like going down to my heads so like i use double ply on the top and the bottom code drum heads um it just gives you a, a natural sort of a deadening sound it's almost like what's the word it's almost like cancels it kind of cancels each other out kind of having double ply but it just kind of gives you like a nice fat sort of sound like Motown you know it's like one of my favorite genres of music and kind of you listen to like drums on Motown it's quite rich and fat and you know I love like I said as much as I love Zeppelin I don't want a boomy you know stadium kit um and the the drums I use um Q Drum Co based in LA I've got a copper kit you, you, you uh no because I didn't have my copper kit at Black Deer but I had a copper snare um but again copper is quite a warm metal compared to like aluminium or brass or whatever you know copper is generally the, the the warmest of the metal it's weird because you think like how's metal warm because you think like maple like in drums maple's quite a warm sound but if you go for something like mahogany or birch birch typically the harder wood slightly less porous brighter sound obviously maple is more porous and it's softer so you get a warm sound anyway um so yeah copper kit you know that's what i you know i've never used a metal kit in my life i think i went to see nine inch nails at the motor point arena in cardiff and Lan Rubin uh, was using a, a Q Drum Co steel kit, I think. And not, I'd never seen a metal kit, but it just sounded incredible. Obviously, you know, the sound of the kit or like your guitar, whatever's, you know, heavily influenced on not just the kind of material you're using, but what preamps you go through, pedals, the sound engineer, EQ, all, all that kind of, all those factors. But yeah, I was just like, okay. And I literally bought, bought one listening to all these sound clips. I thought, yeah, I'm going to get one, ditch my Tama maple custom, whatever. And yeah, just, I'm, I'm all. I love metal, but yeah, it's all metal. Snare drum is a copper plate snare. I think it's like 10 mil thick. I can't remember. It's just heavy, heavy bastard. But I love it, you know. Um, yeah, I just, I think probably like you, I spent probably, I, you know, I started drumming, what, 10? Maybe started 10, 
ish. I mean, I really got into drums when I, I said when I used to go to church. I didn't have a drummer for the band, but I was about what fourteen. But yeah, sort of probably what twenty five years plus twenty. I don't know. But I spent so long like researching equipment and sound and things like you know what sound do I like and kind of what's the word yeah you know, like so honing your craft and kind of, it's not just about I don't know playing a guitar that John Five plays or or I don't know playing uh you know the same kit that I don't know Keith Moon played or whatever you know it's it's just understanding you got to understand the equipment how it works and the sound and just kind of even like tuning like you know tuning drums are boring but you kind of got to do it and there is a science to it you know but really there kind of isn't because you can generally tell if something sounds out of tune you know you'll know like, oh that lug over there sounds a bit off um but like to give you an example i'll generally what most people do finger tight every lug until they're all the same tension and then generally go around doesn't matter clockwise anti-clockwise getting them all all the lugs sounding the same and then what I kind of do is I kind of detune lugs at random, like just again give yourself a a, 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 a different sound. Um, you know, some people. I mean, I'll kind of crank the head up maybe all the way as tight as it can go to bed the head in a bit, and then kind of detune them all evenly. And I said I'll sort of go twelve o'clock, three o'clock. I don't know, eight o'clock. I'll just detune them. Just go right, okay, and just hit the synth. Hit you know, hit the the skin in the middle as you're going round, and you just get like a yeah, like I said, just a different sound. Like I said, you know when it sounds off. Um, but it's yeah, it's, drums are boring. Maybe to guitarists, I don't know. But it's yeah, it's there's a fine there's a fine art um, to, to to drums. I mean, do you know uh, there's a guy called Tommy Clefetos who was the drummer for Sabbath in their kind of the end tour. I was watching a podcast. And he basically said something, which I was like, okay, I didn't know that. So um, I get really irritated by like snare, like buzz on you know on the snare wire. So you know if you're not drumming, you know the bass player is doing something, or I don't know, you hit your kick drum and it just buzz. I just it fizzes. I hate it. Um, you can never eliminate it completely. But basically, he said if your resonant head is the same frequency, so you'd say so your tom resonant head. Sorry. If that's the same frequency as the resonant head on your snare, um, then you know again because it's you've got kind of got two frequencies that are trying to compete against each other. It could you know you could have like your snare head could be like 0.5 of a kilohertz higher or hertz or whatever higher than your your, your tom one, but it's just that that 0.1 of a hertz or whatever can make a massive difference. And the thing is like the the head of a the resonant head of a snare is generally the same material. It's quite a thin mylar or whatever um tom heads like i said it's mine's like i said a double ply so it's a different head but just again you can still tune them to the relatively the sound the same sort of uh the same frequency but i mean even things like so i've got a eight eight is it eight strand snare wire i think you can get strands that go up to about 18 you know but mine's again copper wire so say a bit warmer but yeah just trying to minimize that buzz and it kind of works you know kind of even you go to the point where you kind of hum the frequency to your to your, your you know your resonant head and you can kind of feel if you're off if the head's off and then kind of i don't know humming into the resonant head and just yeah seeing where it's, it's so geeky that's the thing I, I love because i think if you understand your instrument to that kind of degree that kind of detail i, I don't know i just think you want, yeah you understand your instrument more and you kind of what's the word it's i guess it's kind of like riding a horse once you understand the horse more and how to control it it's just a bit more of a like yeah. experience so if i play a kit a house kit and it's nicely tuned i love playing if i get a kit and i play it and it's so hot like obviously i'll have to tune it i don't know i just don't have that sort of a great feel you know playing a, a badly tuned you know or like you play a, for an amp head and you've got two valves that are out or something like that and you can hear it just crack it. yeah it's just yeah it's the sound if you don't get the sound that you want i mean i'm, I'm i get proper eggy you know <laughs> i'm just like if I'm doing a gig or whatnot, or, or you know, something's off, mm. I get funny about it. Um, yeah, I think I think New Year New Year's resolution for me would definitely be to uh, dive a little bit more into the workings behind them. You know, I play them, uh, and I've been playing them for a long time. But actually, understanding and knowing is a different different gen. You know, like you, the detail that you know about your instrument. Now. Yeah. For me, so to have that level of detail so actually probably be a good idea maybe now to start thinking oh, all right yeah maybe uh, i'll get into the nitty-gritty of it 
and the, you know the different sounds and why the different sounds as well, um, rather than just rocking up, playing, learning. Um, actually, learn about the behind the scenes of it as well. So, yeah. Maybe have a go at building your own guitar, Dave, because Dave's quite you know. He's Martin a... does. Martin's built four. Hey? Uh, he built guitars. Martin's built four of his own guitars. Yeah. Um, and just yeah, my God, they're uh, they're impressive. Just trying to convince him to like get into it full time and, and start selling them, but uh, he, he's not. He's teetering on the edge of whether he's going to do it or not. But uh, yeah, yeah, man, that's been cool. But I think yeah, I think that's 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 probably it. I mean, so well, there's one question I was going to ask again. You know, I think you might have covered it. Like, if if there's anything, so for any musician, so I don't know, let's sort of aim it at guitarists. Like, if there's any bit of advice, one bit of advice for anyone who's watching who wants to yeah play guitar or whatever, you know, is there any kind of one main bit of advice that is kind of you know served you well or, uh, over these years? You know, is there any one bit of advice that you'd say you know if you want to play guitar, you know, apart from like patience, um, yeah, what, yeah, what what kind of one bit of advice would you give budding guitar players? I would just say don't get put off by it, you know, like ignore the competition when you, if you're, if you're starting up and you, you want to go for it and, and things like that. And I think so many times in the past where I've been like, oh, I'm, I'm not going to be as good as them. It's just like, well, yeah, because you're just starting, but you will be as good as them if you keep on playing. Them. Um, and yeah, not obviously the patience, but don't be put off when you start is seriously because i i think i was when i first you know 18 got the guitar and then, oh, i don't know what to do don't know where to go don't know how to play it and 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 these guys are better than me i'm not going to go up on stage when yeah. i'm going after this lot uh you know you've got to separate that you know you're a different genre you're different type you're a different style guitarist you know it's, just don't be put off by it yeah, I think it's like you are you. You play to the best. You play the best you can. It doesn't yeah. matter what anyone says about you. Again, Tommy Clavetto said this, a similar thing. He said, "No one can tell you how to play drums, how to play guitar. You know, no one can tell you that you're playing it right or playing it wrong. You know, play it the best damn you know to your ability. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. And no one can tell you yes or no. You know, you just do, yeah, the best damn job you can. And yeah, fuck other people. You know." Yeah, one hundred percent, man. Definitely, uh, it, it rings true. It rings true, man. But thank, like, thanks for taking the hour and twenty odd minutes. Um, hope I haven't bored you too yeah, much. Already, <laughs> I, haven't, uh, I haven't bored you too much about drums. But um, yeah, yeah, I said, cool. hopefully, I'm hopefully, like I said, we'll um, look up next year for for a couple of gigs, or if we're you know up your way. I, to be honest, I don't think we are. Like Gloucester, Great Yarmouth. Yeah, I don't think we're anywhere sort of near you this year but yeah right. I'll pass my cross this year if not definitely um, definitely next year definitely next year for sure man that would be cool Thank but you enjoy me. enjoy your gig man and uh, yeah I mean I said I'll edit some bits out but yeah I'll let you know when this video is going to go up probably probably next week or week after I don't know I've got to edit the Adam Box video but yeah I'll get it out and then yeah just put it on your I'll put it on my YouTube I'll upload the podcast to like Spotify and things and uh, yeah once it's out I'll send you the link and um, yeah share it and um yeah, if any of the other guys in the band want to want to have a go, at, uh, you know. An yeah, Mike, Mike's, well, Mike's well up for it. Um, he, he, you know, he, he's a proper drum nerd. Uh, yeah, I've so asked him. I'll, I'll get him on it at, uh, at some point. Yeah, definitely, man. Yeah, but, just, yeah. just out that bit about the pickups because I'm useless at that. <laughs> no, it's fine. Like I said, it's just. Yeah, I said I, I'm just interested in him and, and and whatnot. But yeah, have a good gig, man. And uh, yeah, like I said, we'll hook up. I said, if not this year, you know, next year. And, um, yeah, see how it goes. Ah, awesome, bro. Thanks very much. It's been cool. All right. And hopefully the uh, the hangover either gets better or gets worse. I don't know. <laughs> you need to do something, yeah. <laughs> All right, dude. Catch you later, Ken. See you, man. Bye. 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 Bye.